did her internship and residency at the, my alma mater, the Animal Medical Center. And now Sue is with us at the Veterinary Cancer Center. And Sue will be talking about osteosarcoma. Welcome, Dr. Sue. Good morning, everyone. Good, Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. So today we're going to be talking about osteosarcoma. I thought the bone rotate went very well with Halloween coming up. So I'm going to start by telling you about one of my favorite cases that I treated, and this is Seamus. Um, Seamus was adopted about a year before he was diagnosed with osteosarcoma, and Dad adopted lots of racing greyhounds, and I'm pretty sure this guy thinks he's a greyhound. <laughs> And Seamus is a pretty classic case, and we're going to talk about Seamus, and then as we go through the lecture, we'll use him as a good example of the things we expect for osteosarcoma. So when Seamus first came uh, to see me, he was a nine-year-old male castrated greyhound who was diagnosed with osteosarcoma in the left distal radius, a very common location. He had an amputation in October of 2013. He had a normal uh, alkaline phosphatase preoperatively, which is a positive prognostic factor as we'll go through. He had a normal lymph node on histology at the amputation, another wonderful positive prognostic indicator. And we treated him with intravenous carboplatin after surgery, which has now been shown to be one of the chemotherapy of choice. So we're going to go through all of that and unpack it. Seamus was also just one of my favorite cases, and Dad never left the hospital during his treatments, and he really was the ambassador for tripods. You know, Dad would love, love to tell everybody in the waiting room about three-legged dogs and how wonderfully they would do, and he also was just one of those dogs that lowered my blood pressure when he came in. He was just so calming, and he was just such a chill dog, so lots of pictures of him. For those of you that don't know me, in addition to being a VCC, I spend a lot of time doing social media as Dr. Sue Cancer Vet, and I would love for you to check out the different sites that I do. I'm on Facebook, a little bit of Instagram and Twitter, and YouTube vlogs, and I'm using this as a way to raise cancer awareness. I'm trying to break down a lot of the myths and misconceptions about treating pets and cancer. You guys have the hardest job. You are breaking the bad news to clients that the pets have cancer, that there's a bone lesion, and they're so scared to come see us. So I'm really trying to use social media as a way to raise cancer awareness. When I first started using hashtags, I couldn't figure out why there was no spaces between all the words, but my technicians have taught me the way, and these are some of my favorite um, hashtags, kick cancer's butt, live longer, live well. A couple of years ago, I co-wrote a book called The Dog Cancer Survival Guide, and that is in one of the raffle baskets as well. Okay, so I like to break things down. We're gonna talk about who gets, oops, come back here. Uh, who gets cancer, when, where, why, what do we see, and how I treat. So we're gonna start to break that all down for you. So osteosarcoma is a malignant cancer of bone cells. So it's a malignant mesenchymal tumor of primitive bone cells that produce extracellular matrix of osteoid. We don't tell clients that, right? So you'll lose them at hello. So we tell them it's a malignant cancer of bone cells. It's the most common primary bone cancer that we see. So 85% of dogs that present to us with a primary bone cancer, it's gonna be osteosarcoma. And it's estimated to be about 5% of all cancers. So it's one of the more common cancers that we're seeing. When I talk about this cancer with clients, I talk about there's two battlefronts. One is the local battlefront, where the cancer is growing in the bone. It's aggressive locally. We know that it's going to cause bone lysis and bone production. And that you guys know some of the cases are more lytic and some of them are osteo, more osteoproductive. And that has not been shown to be prognostic if it's one or the other. Definitely causes pain and soft tissue swelling. And in worst case scenarios, can cause a pathologic fracture. And I only say worst case scenario not because it's a negative prognostic factor, because it's so dramatic for the owners, right? They need to make that decision what they want to do about if they're going to amputate or not. And so it really becomes very stressful for the family as we'll go through. The second battlefront is the metastasis. And so it's highly metastatic. So aggressive locally and highly metastatic. Only less than 10 to 15% of dogs will have detectable metastasis on their chest radiograph before surgery but 90% will die within the first year if we just treat them with local therapy like amputation and they don't get something systemic like chemotherapy. So who do we see this in? So it's estimated to be greater than 10% of dogs per year will be diagnosed. And as you guys know, it's probably an underestimate. There's plenty of dogs that it's not reported. So it's probably more common than that. It's a cancer of middle-aged and older dogs, right? So seven to nine-year-old dogs. It has been reported in dogs as young as six months of age. There's also a second peak incidence 
of dogs about a year and a half to two years of age. And that's one of the reasons that osteosarcoma is a translational um, cancer for pediatric cancer as well, because teenagers can get it as well. In rib location, we tend to see it in dogs that are a little bit younger than the average location. So I'm a breedist. What do I mean by that? I'm at the dog park, right? And I see a great day, and what do I think? Osteosarcoma, right? So not a good way to make friends at the dog park, but. <laughs> So it's a cancer of large and giant breed dogs, and we know that it's, what's more important than the breed is the increasing height and weight of the dog. So size is definitely more important than breed, but some of the common breeds are listed on the slide. For the non-appendicular, for the non-limb ones, we can see it in any breed at any location. For this talk, we're predominantly going to be focusing on the appendicular ones. So where do we see it? So 75% of appendicular, 25% are in the non-long bones, and it's usually in the metaphyseal region, right? So it's going to be not in the center of the bone, at the ends of the bone. Towards the knee, away from the elbow, right? So we see it in the distal radius, the proximal humerus, the distal femur, and then the proximal uh, tibia. The, um, there's one little exception to that that we'll go through. We tend to see more a lot equally in the front legs than the back legs, Distal radius and proximal humerus are the most common location. And we can also see it in the distal tibia. So towards the knee away from the elbow doesn't, you know, isn't going to help us remember that. So you can see it in the distal tibia location as well, so by the hock. Distal to the carpus and hock, very uncommon. I just saw my first metacarpal one about a year and a half ago, and that was the first one in my career. So not very common at all. Where do we see it? So these are some of the non uh, limb locations. What I'd like you to the highlight from this is that the two most common locations that you'll see not in the long bones are going to be the jaw, the, mand the mandible, and the maxillary bones. About 10% of cases can be multicentric. When I first got into private practice in California, I had a Roddy that had bilateral distal radius osseos. I know, talk about crappy day. Um, and then there's this. Um, subset of tumors that are extraskeletal osteosarcomas that you can see in the soft tissue, and mammary is the most common one. You can see it in the spleen and in the subcutaneous tissues as well. So those are going to be uncommon ones. So why do we see this cancer? So gender definitely matters and size of the dog matters, as I talk about the height of the dog and the weight of the dog. We know that there's hereditary, so there's genetic things that we'll go through. Males more commonly than females, but we'll definitely see it in both. And then there's this whole thing that came out, I think it was about in 2010, about sex hormones having a protective benefit. And that was one of the really the first cancers that we started to see that testosterone or the other sex hormones like estrogen and progesterone could have a protective benefit for some cancers. And so they looked at rotties that were neutered young, less than one year of age, and one in four developed osteosarcoma, and that was more likely than if they were intact. So again, that's something to think about if you have a high-risk breed and you're talking to the others about the risk of osteosarcoma. We also know that there's environmental and physical factors. So we think that multiple um, small trauma can be related to the development of cancer. Radiation therapy, so in some of these dogs that were doing full course radiation for an incompletely resected soft tissue sarcoma or a mast cell tumor, three to five percent of those cases can actually get osteosarcoma three to five years later. The good news is that that means they're with us three to five years later. That's how the oncologist looks at that. That's how we spend that, right, Dr. Ware? But again, we do know that radiation can cause osteosarcoma. And then we'll talk a little bit about metallic implants. And then some of the genetics, some of the uh, mutations in the tumor suppressor genes have been associated as well. And again, some of the breeds that we know are predisposed to this. <laughs> and then they acquired molecular factors. So this is Mangus, and this was a dog that I saw when I was in the Hudson Valley. And as you can see, he had had bilateral TPL surgery. He um, went to the surgeon because he was lame in one of the legs. The surgeon was worried maybe something happened to the plate. It was about five years out from his two surgeries, and I think the surgeries were done about um, six months apart. So his right leg, everything looked great, and then they took radiographs of the other leg, and you can see that he had lytic changes here, and it was confirmed in amputation that he had osteosarcoma. There was a paper that came out in 2015, and this is unfortunately a very personal for me because my dog has bilateral TPLO surgeries as well, and this paper came out right after she had her first one. 
So they looked at 16 cases, and the median time from when they had the surgery to when they developed osteosarcoma was five years. So Mangus was very on track for that with a pretty wide range of about a year to 10 years. Pelvic limb uh, leg was the most common. So you can see the breakdown with tibial being the most common location. And five of the 16 dogs had metastasis at diagnosis. 13 of the 16 were osteosarcoma, and then there were three other tumor types, histiocytic sarcoma, fibrosarcoma, and soft tissue sarcoma. And the big question is, what is going on? What is the connection between having an implant and having osteosarcoma? Something carcinogenic, possibly from the implant materials? Is there some sort of corrosion from the implants that are left in there? Is there some sort of tissue damage unrelated to the implant that just from some sort of osteomyelitis or the actual injury itself or something that is disturbed in the healing process? So I don't know that we know the answers, but I think it's something to think about in these young dogs like my Matilda who are getting you know, implants when they're four and then the possibility when they're lame that could it be due to cancer. So I have a lot of videos of tripods on my phone, and I really like to show these to owners when we're talking about amputation so they can see how well. So Mangus went ahead and got an amputation. Uh, you can see he's nice and shaved. He's two weeks post-op here. There was a cat in that room. So he had to check it out. And so this was the day of his first carboplatin chemotherapy treatment. Okay, so what do we see? We see pain. We often see lame, lameness and swelling. Again, I told you only about 3% of dogs will actually have that pathologic fracture. What if you have a large and giant breed dog that is lame in one of the classic locations, so towards the knee, away from the elbow, and with the distal tibia, you really want to do radiographs promptly, as soon as you can. Because again, in, in, you know, for these high-risk breeds, it's really osteosarcoma until proven otherwise. And if those owners don't want to do radiographs that day, and you send them home with pain medication, I'd really encourage you to start thinking about, can we get you back in a week or two to see how the dog is doing? Because usually they will temporarily improve on pain meds, but again, there's, you know, I'm always concerned for those high-risk breeds that they're going to have osteo. This was one of my cases where the owners initially refused to do uh, um, an amputation. I always say the tumor is growing a tumor here. This was a uh, distal radius, and the length was 15 centimeters. Uh, this is a screenshot of his radiographs. The owners didn't want to do um, an amputation. Clearly, you can see there's a pathologic fracture and so much bone destruction. So this dog wasn't using the leg anyway. The dog actually did go on and get an amputation and did great. All right, so what's the first thing you're going to do for these lame dogs? Radiographs, absolutely. So what do we see? We're going to do two new lame radiographs. Again, as I said, it can be very lytic or it can be mostly osteoblastic. Doesn't typically cross the joints. It crosses the joints, we're thinking something like synovial sarcoma, right? Can go adjacent. So you'll have those distal radius going into the ulnar bones and vice versa. That's not uncommon. And again, it's very similar to um, fungal disease, osteomyelitis. So it really depends on the location. We don't see a lot of fungal diseases in bone here. Sometimes when I'm lecturing in other parts of the country, that's going to be higher up on their list of differentials due to the location of where they are. So the typical things that we'll see on radiographs, we typically see cortical lysis. So here's the radiograph of this bone. Um, so you can kind of see the gross changes as well. Codman's triangles, the lights are a little bright here, but this is this um, triangular shaped deposition of bone at the cortex and the periphery. Um, we often see new bone extension in a sunburst pattern. Again, not very easy to see with the lighting here. And then this was one of my colleagues, a dentist out in the Colorado region. This was his great day, and you can see the soft tissue swelling, much less severe than the other dog that I just showed you. Uh, this was, you know, a few other radiographs. So again, some of these are more lytic. This one was very lytic. Um, this was cream puff. Uh, Mom came to see us when I was in uh, Westchester for stereotactic radiation. Not a good candidate, right? There's not enough bone there. We were definitely worried about fracture there. So again, you're often going to make a presumptive diagnosis, especially in this part of the country where we don't see a lot of fungal disease based on signalment, based on the history, so usually painful, you know, swelling in the area, the physical exam, so the location that we talked about, and then your radiographic changes. What are the other differentials? So I told you about 15% will be the other primary bone cancers. What are the other normal cells that live in the, that, in the bone? And that's how I think about differentials, right? We have cartilage cells. That's a cardiosarcoma. We have blood vessels, that's a hemangiosarcoma. Um, you can have connective tissue in the bone, so those are gonna be fibrosarcoma. Um, if you have metastatic bone cancer, it's usually not metaphyseal, right? Where's the blood supply in a long bone? 
It's right in the middle. So you're usually going to have those, you're going to have a metastatic lesion, usually diaphyseal. Occasionally you'll see multiple myeloma, lymphoma, and some of these other things. But again, 85% of dogs with primary bone cancer, it's osteosarcoma. So one of the ways that I like to confirm a diagnosis for an owner is to do cytology. Is anybody doing bone aspirin cytology? <laughs> very good, Dr. Post. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> so this is something um, that I think you guys could consider doing. It's a little bit scary the first time you do it because you're expecting if your needle hits bone, it's going to stop. And it doesn't. It just kind of goes right in the bone and it just feels way softer and unusual than it should. So it's not a definitive way to make a diagnosis, but it can be very supportive. Um, oh. Oh. I, I did. I did. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then, especially if you send your sample, so any bone aspirin that I send, we send directly to the University of Illinois. And they can add on an alpha staining that can help differentiate, it makes it very sensitive that it's osteosarcoma. So again, it's the only samples that I send there, it's very cost effective, so that's a great way that you can um, confirm. We usually would do mild sedation and analgesia, it hurts the dogs. Um, I wouldn't do it with them without those two things. And usually use an 18 gauge green big needle. It feels weird, um, but again, and then you're going to aspirate back and you usually get a nice sample. Do we have to biopsy? And that's often the big question. And I'll be honest, I don't biopsy most of these cases. Um, again, based on signalment, history, location, radiographs, and the area that we live in where there's little possibility of fungal. And again, when we do an amputation, you're going to confirm the diagnosis. When is there gonna be a case that we're gonna do a biopsy? If you did cytology and it was non-diagnostic, or maybe it said it was uh, something else, like a carcinoma, then I might wanna do it. Or it's just inflammation and I'm starting to doubt how sure I am about the diagnosis. There are gonna be those owners that are not gonna take the leg off, right, without knowing what it is. So maybe that would be the one where I'm gonna do it and cytology didn't confirm it. Again, not a classic case. Maybe the dog is from the Southwest. I just had a case that I'll show you that it was coming from the Arizona area. We were concerned about fungal, and it was a pretty young dog. And you're always gonna submit the leg for the surgery as well. So again, if you're gonna do a limb spare, so that's one of those um, procedures that the surgeons do um, where we're trying to save the leg. You might wanna do a biopsy. You just wanna be careful that you're gonna contaminate the area. One of the other reasons I don't love them is false negatives, 10 to 20%. And sometimes you do them and you still get reactive bone, so they're not always diagnostic. You can ignore the first two methods because I don't recommend them, but if you look them up in books, you'll see them. So open incisional, lots of complications. Tree find is really good, but it increases the risk of fracture, so not my favorite technique. If you are going to have to do a preoperative biopsy, we do a closed needle biopsy with a jam sheety, very accurate at 92% and can give us tumor subtype as well, and you can see the little pores of bone that you get there. Accuracy is definitely dependent on comfort level and experience, which means I don't do them. Um, you would want someone like Dr. Don Nolte, you know, doing those biopsies for you. The tips for it is you want to biopsy at the center of the lesion. And this is different than how we think of a lot of tumors where we worry about the center is going to be a necrotic area. Um, so again, we want to biopsy at the center and usually they'll do a couple of different angles just to try to increase their diagnosis. And oops. Sorry, you can do it image guided as well. And one of the ones that I've done in practice, so at first I was a practice where we had fluoro, and that was great, but not most of us fluoro. You can also do ultrasound guided. And so I had a scapular lesion, so we use the ultrasound probe and we're able to get the sample that way. You can do that both for cytology and for biopsies as well. All right, so we've done our lid radiographs. We've maybe done an aspirin or a biopsy as indicated by the case and the owner. And the next thing we're gonna do is staging, right? So um, a lot of us don't think about aspirating the local lymph node, but studies show that it really drops the prognosis for that. So I do try to aspirate the draining lymph node if possible. We might want to do an orthopedic exam just to make sure that it's a good candidate for being a tripod. And the big one that we definitely want to do, and you guys know this, is the three view radiographs, right? And this confuses owners because you tell them the radiographs are clean and they don't understand the idea of those micro nets. So I tell them that even though the radiographs don't see any nets, we know, again, that 90% of dogs already have microscopic cells. You could do a CT scan, definitely shown to detect um, metastasis earlier, but definitely can chew into your budget. And again, most of the statistics that we quote are based on radiographs and not CT scan. I do want to bring this up because there was a paper in 2012 in JAMA that looked at 33 dogs 
And there were four dogs that had normal chest ra radio ch chest radiographs, but they had positive CT scans, positive for metastasis. And guess what? They were typically large and giant breed dogs, and this is a cancer of large and giant breed dogs. So for the right owner, if they really want to know, I would recommend doing a CT scan. But in practicality, most of us are doing three view chest radiographs. This is Goliath. Full disclosure, it was actually a dog I was seeing for a thyroid carcinoma. We were doing a neck CT before surgery, and we decided because we were CTing the neck to CT the chest, and we actually found these micro or these small nodules so that we wouldn't see on radiographs. So radiographs, they say about eight millimeters, so just under the size, you know, just smaller than a centimeter to pick up nodules. But on CT scan, you can pick things up that are two or three millimeters. So for the right owner, it's important. Oh, look, Dr. Huter. <laughs> That's Dr. Huter, who's our new internist and happens to be my husband. Um, and this is when we were working together at a different hospital. A big question I will get is, do I need to do an abdominal ultrasound for dogs with osteosarcoma? Who says yes? Who says no? Who doesn't care? <laughs> so the correct answer is no. There are studies that show what most oncologists have been saying for years. In general, you know, this is not a cancer that metastasizes to the abdominal organ, so if you're trying to be frugal with the owner's funds, we're not going to be doing an abdominal ultrasound. Sorry, Dr. Peter. Um, but other things that you may want to do, you can do bone survey radiographs. That's where you're taking a lateral of every bone of the dog. I don't really recommend that on a regular basis. Bone scans, conflicting reports of useful, usefulness. And again, abdominal ultrasound in general I'm only going to be doing that if it's a case. Remember I told you that when bones, if I have a lesion in the middle of the bone, and I'm worried about that that's a metastatic lesion, maybe I'm going to be looking for bladder cancer or prostate cancer or things like that. So that would be a case that I wanted to do an abdominal ultrasound. Maybe I do my chemistry panel on the ALTs 1,000 before surgery. I might want to do you know, an ultrasound in that case, or just general health screening. So I'm never against getting an ultrasound, but again, not one of the tests that I'm going to be more adamant about doing. And so I always think about when I'm working with these cases, I call it my three P's. Let's be prognostic. We know that dogs that have next to the lymph node and next to the lungs and a high outcross, that's going to be prognostic. So I want to make sure I'm doing the tests that pick those. I want to be practical. It'd be nice to do a CT scan, but most donors can't afford that, right? And then I want to be pertinent. Does the dog have an eye, a high ALT? That's going to be the one that I'm going to do an ultrasound. So again, we really want to pick the test for the owners. All right, we've done all our testing. What's the next step? Surgery. And what are you going to do? Amputate. <laughs> this is what owners go through when you tell them, right? They were like, what? You want me to take off my dog's leg? And when I did my residency at AMC, I don't think I really appreciated how hard this step was for most owners. And they agonize over this because they're making the decision to remove one of their legs of their dogs. We know how well they do. We know the high owner satisfaction that there is. But again, it really is a very hard decision for most of our owners. So let's talk about treatment. Curative intent treatment is going to bind something local, most likely amputation, with something systemic. We're going to talk about chemo, and then we're going to talk about the new immunotherapy that uh, VCC is one of the practices lucky to be doing some of the studies. And then we'll talk about paleo. What do you do when the owner doesn't want to treat aggressively? We can talk, do just amputation, we'll talk about radiation, and we'll talk about pain management as well. Okay, so curative intent treatment. Like I said, that typically starts with amputation. This is that year and a half year old dog that was just adopted from the Arizona region, so we were a little bit more worried about fungal disease in this dog. Amputation is a standard treatment. Most animals function well. How do you guys feel about amputation? Do you feel comfortable recommending it? Yeah, and is it really hard for most owners when you talk to them about it? They look, yeah, you're all shaking your head or nodding your head. So most owners are pleased with mobility and quality of life, which is very reassuring, but it's getting them through this process. Owners worry, but my dog has arthritis. Most dogs have pre-existing arthritis. I've had dogs that need to have the non-TPLO leg amputated, and they can still do well, and one of those was a bulldog. So again, we just want to have a careful preoperative exam to look for any orthopedic and neurologic issues. But most dogs will get the clearance for an amputation. So for the front leg, we usually do a complete amputation. And then the hind leg, you just want to make sure that you remove the whole leg. So if it's a distal femur, you need to remove the whole femur. You can't do a mid-femur one on that. Um, and then we're going to warn the owners, right? Big shave job, huge incision. 
When I was lecturing one time, the internist I was working with in the Hudson Valley sent me this picture. And this was Jerry, who was post-operative from his amputation. He said, here's your new patient, Jerry. His tail was wagging too much in the ICU that in the metal cage. He was disturbing everybody, all the other animals. So they moved him over to the doctor's office, and he said, Jerry, can't wait to see you when you come back. But again, you know, owners like to see that dog standing, wagging his tail, happy as can be, you know, again, one day after surgery. So this is one of the times where internet is definitely our friend because you want to prepare owners, show them pictures, you know, very large shaved jobs. We often have the owners bring a t-shirt, right, to cover that incision so they don't have to look at it. And this is the one, do you guys know about tripods? So it's a great community of pet owners that have three-legged dogs and cats. Tons of videos, huge support network. A uh, really good organization, so that would be one for your clients to check out. And you can just go to uh, uh, YouTube in your exam room or tell the owners and Google three-legged dogs, and you'll see dogs running in the snow and playing and things like that. And I really think that helps owners make that difficult decision. This was Bella. Owners were told because she's a great dame that she could not be three-legged. She was not putting weight on that leg when she came to see me. She was actually, she was a pretty small great dame. She was only about 85 pounds. She had a very, so her tumor, you know, length was about 13 centimeters. I was concerned because it had been diagnosed two months earlier, so we sedated her and took some radiographs. Two months ago, they did the aspirate, which confirmed that she had a sarcoma, was highly suspicious for osteosarcoma. And I was really worried that maybe she would have um, a fracture because it had been on for so long, you know, been two months, but again, her radiographs looked okay. You can look at that significant soft tissue swelling that we talked about, all of the lysis and the thinning of the cortices that we talked about, pretty classic. So this was a dog that I was a little bit concerned about being getting amputations. This is Hank. He was two weeks post-op, still wearing his t-shirt, which was like the beauty queen thing, so wasn't even covering his incision anymore. But the owners just kept it on, and it kind of just hung down as a waist. So again, body condition score is definitely one of the things we worry about, so dogs that are overweight in the study that I'll show you don't always do as well. But again, most owners do well. And this is a great study if you're looking for stats to back it up. 91% of about 65 owners said there was no change in the dog's attitude. Almost 90% said their dogs had a complete or nearly complete return to quality of life from before surgery. 80% said the recovery wasn't as bad as they thought it was gonna be. And 70% plus said there was no change in recreational activity. So I've had dogs that can still swim, still herd sheep when I was up at Cornell. So um, lots of good things. This is Bella. She was the first picture that I posted on my Facebook page many years ago. And she actually had a subcutaneous hemangiosarcoma and she would, mom would not amputate. She said, no, 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 never will. We did radiation, it ended up growing back, it got infected and she amputated. And to this day, and I wanna say probably eight years later since the amputation, Bella's mom will still talk to any owner that I need to because she felt so bad that she waited so long to do the amputation. And here Bella is celebrating her seventh birthday. She was a year and a half out at the time, and she's in her little New York City cafe, you know, outdoors, enjoying her fondant cake. Um, it, she actually lived over four years. But again, that's another great way is have an owner who had a good experience talk to your owners. If you can find one that will, that helps. So dogs that are heavy, overweight, negatively associated with um, quality of life after. Would they do it again? 86% of owners do it again. I've done polls on Facebook. Owners are usually happy. The ones that didn't do well, they're pretty, they have strong feelings about it. But again, most owners are really happy with the quality of life and would do it again. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about limb spare, but I think it's good to know that there are some